morning, everybody. Uh, I guess uh, I can begin simply by summarizing uh, my feeling about uh, the, uh, the conference so far, which is simply drat. I've been scooped. Uh, not just once, but multiple times. Uh, so in, in planning the, the conference, I drew the uh, task, the, uh, the opportunity, to speak to you on the topic of narratives. And as it turns out, uh, basically everything that I was going to say uh, has been said uh, yesterday uh, in ways that were far, far better and eloquent and memorable uh, than anything I could have dreamed up, uh, especially from, uh, uh, based on Karen's uh, and Ursula's accounts, both from the practice of, uh, of novel writing and from the, the uh, critical uh, uh, perspective on uh, speculative fiction. So uh, I thought I would then in, instead then just kind of uh, sort of condense uh, very briefly what I thought I was going to say, just to kind of reiterate and uh, bring out some of the major issues that I thought were uh, of, great, uh, of great use for us yesterday, but then also then to uh, kind of uh, pick out some of the stuff in there uh, and kind of look at it from a different angle in order to begin to highlight some other things uh, that, uh, that I think are worth highlighting that maybe mentioned only very briefly yesterday, or uh, maybe not at all yet yesterday. But then the, the sort of second threat scoot uh, comes in, uh, having just uh, uh, witnessed uh, Eric Hesden and Jasmine Trice's uh, presentations in the previous session, uh, which uh, go into uh, film, blind spots, uh, the potential of, of other ways of, of uh, uh, confronting audiovisual images and so on, much of which you'll see is already built into what I thought was going to be the new part today. So in fact, nothing here is new. Uh, but hopefully this will be a second way or a second uh, chance to revisit some of these uh, uh, matters. So again, the key word that was uh, supposed to be uh, uh, organizing my presentation today here is narratives, which of course is very central, uh, not just to scholarship, uh, to academic work, to teaching, and so on, uh, but uh, very precisely so, uh, very, it's very central to question of what we're doing in urban humanities and what urban humanities can do for us. Okay, so again, uh, going to the preliminaries, this is again sort of background of the stuff that I thought was going to be uh, the substance of my talk. Uh, I, I had, had begun to think about uh, narrative theory uh, in terms of the pairs of terms. If you kind of survey, you know, like my, my original background is in comparative literature, so if you go back into the, uh, the many decades of narrative theory, narrative studies, narratology, we find that there's all kinds of pairs of terms that are proposed for taxonomies, whether it's story, plot, and discourse, the enunciated versus enunciation, etc. And this uh, uh, reminded me that, in fact, narrative has this uh, kind of structuring moment built into it. It's a kind of moment of splitting, doubling, and as uh, William Marathi pointed out yesterday in terms of field work, this is a question of doubling uh, of the experience and the question of what it is that we're doing and that then opens up this space of reflexivity, which is precisely what we're doing here uh, during these couple of days, reflecting upon and trying to figure out and move forward with this concept of uh, urban humanities. Uh, in addition, as I just mentioned, uh, Karen Yamashita and uh, Ursula Heiss uh, yesterday spoke very, very eloquently uh, about the, uh, the role of speculativeness in fiction and the ways in which fiction, uh, especially as they're sort of on the borders fiction and, and reality, uh, open up a kind of a, a awareness of otherness, displacement, absence, all the things that are not quite there, that, that, uh, that fiction, because it's, uh, because it's just fiction, uh, are actually, is actually able to capture something about the real, in this kind of elsewhere or elsewhere. Uh, finally, uh, uh, we also heard uh, 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 some references to various uh, dimensions of the narrative, uh, visual narratives, uh, spatial or spatialization of narratives, and so on, which uh, reminded me of a, a, a kind of a second direction that I had originally thought of uh, pursuing, which was uh, the, the, the role, therefore, if you built upon this idea of narrative, of uh, beginning with this moment of splitting in pairs of terms, uh, the, the role of narrative in uh, multiplying, connecting, sequencing, and ordering. And those of you who have studied cinema, cinema are very uh, familiar with all of various kinds of terminologies, theories, and, and great examples having to do with things like the editing, montage, and so on. 
So finally, I thought, well, a third uh, possible direction to take uh, this exploration of narrative uh, into would be to think of narrative uh, in these kind of functional ways, uh, which functions as a mode of explanation, uh, of organization, uh, and very important communication. Right? The communication studies, of course, we uh, used to break things down to the speaker and the audience and the content and the message and so on, all of which is a, a, another kind of schematic way simply to remind us of the, the general lesson that narrative has a very important role to play in building and, and constructing and possibly contesting uh, certain kinds of social situations. There's a kind of interactivity here. There's an event of narrative, uh, which then uh, may actually uh, lead uh, into some kind of, as Jennifer was pointing out a minute ago, uh, questions of action and possibly even you know, intervention. So this is where I began to deviate from what I thought I was going to, uh, originally thought I was going to, discuss with you today, but actually, as it turns out, has already been discussed just uh, an hour ago. Uh, so I return to the, uh, to the, uh, the original uh, kind of a synopsis a proposal of this conference, uh, which claims uh, that uh, design, the design fields uh, are action-oriented, and somehow it's on this basis that we want to uh, bring together the design fields with humanities uh, uh, kinds of work that, that is also action-oriented. So not all humanities where it seems to be that way, but the, the thesis here is that there is some that's very exciting and, and, and uh, uh, has a lot of potential uh, precisely to fit together with the design field because of this kind of, uh, this kind of action orientation. Uh, it was pointed out yesterday at some point that, that in fact process can be just as important, uh, but at the same time, this action-oriented uh, kind of uh, 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 attitude of course, it very much stresses products, results, and deliverables. So I began to think, well, you know, what counts this action uh, may be a kind of a difficult question to deal with, but also what counts as the products, deliverables, and results. We've seen in some of the examples so far that we, especially that we saw yesterday, uh, some very clear examples where you know, you're kind of looking to see exactly that there is a result, or that's that's the deliverable, or that's a, a pretty map, or or some kind of a, a account of, uh, of selfies and so on. Uh, but in fact, uh, if we then go back to the question of process and how this fits into this, uh, then we, uh, things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, so uh, I'd like to also uh, remind us that, as Anthony Pascardi mentioned yesterday, there's uh, there's a tendency here uh, that I'm feeling that, that uh, we may be on the, you know, danger of homogenizing and even reifying something called the humanities. If you want to be very uh, very kind of literal about it, of course, we can all think about your own institutions. I'm sure there is some kind of a division or college or something like that as a kind of you know, <coughs> the humanities. And you think about all the different departments and disciplines and different kind of faculty uh, that are, that are uh, in, in that division of humanities right here at, at UCLA. Within the division of humanities, we have Think about undergraduate courses. There are courses on uh, Japanese language uh, in the same division of humanities as there are uh, undergraduate courses on uh, you know, theories of musicology, for example. So uh, this homogenization or reification may be coming uh, precisely in order to extract something called uh, the product or the result or the deliverable in order to kind of make this uh, 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 translation or, or uh, coordination a little bit easier with the, the design disciplines. Uh, this, the, there may be also a tendency to do this in order to lend legitimacy to the design disciplines and the other adjectival things that are now getting kind of stapled onto uh, the humanities here at UCLA, with urban humanities, environmental humanities, medical humanities, public humanities, and so on. Uh, some of which already are existing, some of them are uh, in the proposal stage. This is not to be a kind of criticism of these things, or that we shouldn't do them, but rather uh, maybe to, to uh, recognize that, there may, that this may be in part sort of the price to pay for these kinds of interdisciplinary uh, spaces. Now, I, I, I started to think in a, in, a, in a kind of roundabout way uh, to this analogy of the idea of mass production. Right? Of course, we know that mass production on the surface, we always think first of all of the mass production of particular goods and the various kinds of economics and organizational infrastructure attached to those. But of course, we also know that the other side of that coin, of the mass production of the hamburgers or the automobiles or whatever, 
is, of course, the production of people, uh, the masses, uh, as worker consumers. So in a, in a similar kind of way, uh, I, I'm thinking about the humanities aspect here, the urban humanities, uh, not just as the study of the human, which is a, a fairly a common and, and kind of a, almost kind of a, a overly reductive sort of uh, definition, but also humanity as uh, a mode of the production of humanity. And this is actually going back to a very common kind of defense of the humanities nowadays, that it, it cultivates uh, thoughtfulness, intelligence, sensitivity, uh, responsibility, and so on. But of course, uh, many defenses of the humanities nowadays also appeal to uh, uh, things like the idea that we're cultivating certain kinds of survival skills, like how to listen and take notes, or how to read an essay once and get the main idea. And this is the kind of thing that we you know, really try to stress to undergraduate students in our humanities courses, especially if they're taking it simply for requirement purposes, but they're actually studying engineering or, or, uh, or finance or whatever. Uh, so uh, a, a second kind of detour here then uh, goes through this thing that in cinema studies is sometimes referred to as the modernity thesis. This is a kind of a loose collection of ideas uh, the most basic one of which is that cinema it produces and is a product of uh, modernity. And it's oftentimes kind of delighted that this is specifically urban modernity, right? That cinema as a, as a technology, as a, as a social uh, kind of uh, uh, activity, as a kind of um, institutional or technological uh, phenomenon, all begins in the cities, right? Uh, there, there's, a whole, uh, there's other uh, parts of this so-called modernity thesis, but we should remember that, number one, uh, this has come under a lot of debates. There's, there's quite a lot of skepticism about, about some of the, the following ideas that are added on to this. And number two, that the, the phrase, the modernity thesis, is one that, that not many people who are supposedly proponents of it actually use. It's a, it's a, kind, of a, a kind of umbrella term that, in fact, people who want to critique that idea actually kind of uh, use to lump together these various kinds of ideas. But the uh, basic uh, part of this that I think can be a useful reminder for us here as a, a conceptually is that cinema it, it becomes here a uh, kind of occasion, or you might even say apparatus, for training, for practice, for habituation, for learning how to be in the world, uh, uh, in particular the, the urban, uh, modern world. So uh, from, from this I'm beginning to think then about how cinema in particular, and of course this is drawn from my own uh, specialty in research and teaching, at how cinema, in the context of urban humanities, uh, can be a, a way uh, to help us to cultivate ways uh, for envisioning uh, th through these kind of heterogeneous uh, audiovisual narratives and materials, the images that we're confronted with, and so on. And this is where I'm beginning to feel this kind of resonance, or, if, as I said before, in a kind of pessimistic way, with that kind of draft feeling of uh, having been scooped just a, uh, an hour ago by uh, Eric Heston's really wonderful film. Uh, which is all about the blind spot, right? Stuff that is sort of there but not quite, and we're, we're even trying to grasp at what kind of language we can use in order to describe uh, this kind of audiovisual uh, phenomenon. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, we'll turn now uh, to a quick, uh, a quick uh, a kind of progress report about what we're doing this year in the Urban Humanities uh, Seminar at UCLA. As you know, we're, we uh, take up a, a full year uh, coursework uh, for graduate students. <clears throat> and each year, uh, the Urban Humanities Initiative here at UCLA uh, focuses on one particular uh, Pacific Rim megacity in, in comparison with our home city of Los Angeles. So last year was Tokyo, and this year was Shanghai. In addition to which, we, we put that together with one particular kind of keyword or theme or issue. And so this year is identity. So we have Shanghai plus identity. So one of the first things that we ask the students to look at, uh, and this is a, a kind of a, a kind of a springboard between the summer intensive workshop, which is a lot of sort of methodology stuff, and the actual uh, uh, meat of the, of the fall quarter. Uh, in the in the intersession there, we asked them to watch a few films. One of which that they that they had the choice of was this film, her, and. If you've seen this film, there's, there's also you can talk about this for hours and hours. It's a very, very interesting film. Uh, all sorts of stuff. You know, we could go on for hours just doing kind of close reading of the movie poster. Right? It says her, but it's clearly this guy with the beautiful mustache is definitely him. Right? Uh, and so, what's the, this is of course the hook that gets you interested in buying a movie ticket. 
As you know, her is set in this kind of a, a sort of a near future alternative kind of Los Angeles in which this fellow Theodore is one of these kind of morose, uh, stay-at-home, uh, uh, melancholic bachelors uh, who falls in love with his computer. Right? That's the basic hook. Uh, the guy falls in love with his computer. Uh, what this really means in, in a little more detail is that there's an operating system, and a kind of intelligent operating system, uh, who he then assigns a, a, a gender, namely female. Uh, she uh, picks a name for herself, Samantha, and she becomes a, a sort of lover love object or lover for him, and she herself grows, right? The part, the intelligent part is that she has a personality, she grows and changes. And in the end, of course, she, uh, she sort of breaks up with him. Uh, so, of course, the, uh, one of the, one of the, the sort of ongoing uh, thematic uh, uh, issues here is the, is, the, is the difference between the embodied real person, uh, Theodore, and this uh, disembodied uh, personality, Samantha, uh, who, in, in her, in terms of the material structure, has little more presence than the, the, the cell phone here. And we can see the cell phone here is a sort of model in this kind of a quasi. It, here too, we can sort of feel the, the kind of a back and forth motion of the speculative and the sci-fi mode, where much of the art design, the fashion, and so on, uh, reflects a kind of uh, 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 it's a kind of uncanny moment where sort of the near future looks kind of like what Mad Men was supposed to look like. Right? So the, the, what, I think one of the art designers was quoted somewhere as saying that this, this cell phone, uh, custom-made cell phone prop here, was modeled partly on uh, either cigarette cases or uh, old-fashioned Zippo lighters. Right? So uh, uh, behind all this, of course, and this is, why, this is why it was of great interest to us in this seminar, uh, is the fact that the Los Angeles uh, where much of this takes place is actually Shanghai. Uh, specifically, it's the uh, Lu Jiazui financial district in Pudong, where much of the location shooting was done for this film. And so here we see kind of behind the scenes, uh, you can see in the background there the, the man with the black t-shirt and the shorts. That's the cameraman who's operating the, uh, the steady cam, and you see the boom microphone in the back, etc. Uh, this is a scene that's being uh, shot on a walkway in the Wuzhou Financial District, and you recognize that kind of tripod structure, the huge tripod structure in the back, is the uh, the Pearl, uh, the Oriental Pearl TV Tower. So, uh, what what was of great interest to, to us here was then the way in which uh, Shanghai appears here uh, as a stand-in for a near future uh, Los Angeles. This is quite quite the opposite of what we might normally think, especially from a Chinese perspective, sort of gazing at the United States and thinking that's our future, that's the future that we hope for. Here it's actually the exact opposite, where uh, Shanghai uh, stands in for the future of Los Angeles. Uh, so this is just one example of how uh, how, how film, the actual film settings uh, in, in particular cities, which are very recognizable, but uh, here it's, it's very recognizable, this one particular neighborhood in Shanghai, it's not even all of Shanghai, it's this one particular part of Shanghai, and one particular image of Shanghai, which is standing in here for this fictionalized version of, of another real city, uh, Los Angeles. It's this kind of, uh, it's these kinds of operations, this is partly what Jasmine uh, was speaking about before, about the kind of hidden labors of film production. Uh, and I didn't quite uh, really appreciate this until, and this is the last example I'll get to, I didn't really appreciate this until I, I, it sort of clicked that, of course, at the same time, in the same year, this year, uh, by, by a happy coincidence, there was another film. Uh, you remember that Samantha, the voice of the, voice of the operating system, is provided by Scarlett Johansson, right? So she, she's Scarlett Johansson, the former and maybe still reigning sexiest woman in the world, etc., but we never see her, and she has no body. Uh, so it just turns out by happy coincidence that in a similar kind of way uh, this year there was another film in which we see lots of Scarlett Johansson's Lucy, uh, directed by Luc Besson. And this film is, is a kind of opposite uh, premise where there's a, a, a sort of regular person, Lucy, in fact she's a kind of a graduate student hanging up in Taipei or something. She could be one of our students you know, spending a semester there, studying Chinese, uh, partying at night, and getting into trouble eventually. Uh, finally, uh, it's not in the classroom or the seminar room, but, but somehow through this sort of strange uh, drug transaction gone awry that she figures out finally how to use uh, 100%, the legendary 100% of her actual brain power instead of the 10% that most of us are kind of stuck with. And so, so this is, the, this, is, uh, this is what happens. This is the, the real uh, 
embodied, embodied uh, Lucy as Scarlett Johansson, but, but actually in the end, as those of you know, and this is a spoiler alert, in the end what happens when she finally figures out how to use that 100% of her brain power, uh, she, she morphs herself into a USB flash drive. <laughs> Uh, a nice throwback, uh, a near a near future obsolete technology, right? Well, sort of like Terence uh, floppy disks that we were talking about before. Uh, the 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 interesting thing that makes this a, a, a sort of a semi parallel example with her, of course, is that much of this part of the film, the first third or so of the story, was filmed on location in the city of Taipei in Taiwan, and this is a very uh, publicized event, uh, following on the heels of the great success of Life of Pi, much of which was produced in Taiwan, but not, not, not only a little bit in Taipei. Uh, but here, uh, unlike Life of Pi, uh, the, the city of Taipei is showcased very prominently. We see the usual kind of postcard cityscapes. You recognize the Taipei 101 uh, famous skyscraper. And finally here, on uh, the closing of shooting, uh, Luc Besson had a, a, con a press conference there thanking the mayor personally uh, for, uh, for helping out here. So, uh, uh, so, so what we have here then is the is the kind of uh, the the reminder that in fact what we're what we're looking at here is not not simply the features of films or or you know, learning what the what what's really going on in the films, but actually testing out and cultivating new ways in which we can uh, and in which we uh, real people are interacting with the films that we watch. Uh, as Eric was saying, we watch this film and at, at some point we start daydreaming and just watching the Taipei cityscape and forget about the sea. Uh, as, as difficult as she may be to forget. In fact, this film is a kind of really terrible film, but in very interesting ways. Uh, among other things, it has a it has a it has a professor who's a hero, right? That's a, that's a great inspiration. <laughs> so, so if I can finally, in closing, kind of uh, uh, offer a, a, a little bit of a twist to, uh, to the narrative, or a little bit of intervention, is simply to remind ourselves again, uh, in the spirit of, of uh, coming at this from the humanities perspective. Uh, rather than a design perspective, uh, is that uh, what, what we may uh, want to consider is not just uh, what urban humanities is or how we're making urban humanities, but how we're in fact making urban humanities.